Hey everyone, Wayne Fox back with another video about these little scanners, the Epson FF640 and the FF680. They're designed to take a box of snapshots and in a really quick order, scan them into your computer at a couple of different resolutions. I've done a couple of videos about these already that talk about the quality, what you can expect out of them, and maybe the couple of settings you might want to consider. So this video is more about actually, actually how to go through the process, how to use the software, now you can use these scanners for a lot more than this. They can do really good document scanning. You can uh, probably do PDFs. I think you can even uh, get some character recognition software. And I might get into those later, but mainly this is for my series of how to digitize your memories. And I'm gonna be going through all of the options. Now, when you have a bunch of pictures like this that are quite old, you've got probably four different options to get these uh, digitized. Obviously the easiest way would be to just take a picture of each one with something like your uh, iPhone. Um, that's actually not a bad way to go because an iPhone or all of the smartphones now, their cameras are plenty good enough to do that. And I've actually got a video in the works about how to go through that process. It does take a lot more time because you're taking one at a time, but quality wise is pretty good. You can get a decent picture to show on a website or on your TV. Next step up would be these little scanners. The downside of these is they're pretty pricey. It's, I think they're around $600. But you can use them for more than just this. You can scan eight by tens or bigger. You can scan documents. You can scan straight to stop Dropbox. So it's probably a good, pretty good way to archive more than just photographs. And I really like these little scanners. I think Epson did a pretty nice job giving you features and decent quality. Yep, I've got a video that compares them to a high-end scanner. No, they're not that good, but for this kind of stuff, they're pretty good. Obviously you can use a flatbed scanner and get really high quality scans. And if you got really good high super quality large prints, especially uh, old black and white prints. That's a better way to go because these just can't scan that much detail. Snapshots like this, there's just really not that, it's not as much detail in these as you think. So 300 DPI or maybe 600 DPI, that's the best you really need. So anyway, this video is about how to use this little scanner here. I'm gonna demonstrate it on the 680 because I don't believe you can buy the 640 anymore. I thought originally the 680 was not a good investment, but Epson, as I pointed out in my last video, they fixed a couple of the problems. And as long as you turn the auto enhance feature off, it kind of resolves the noise problem. So quality wise, it's it's not a bad scanner to go. I personally am still using the 640 to scan mine, but the only difference between the two is the way you feed them into the scanner. So as we feed these through the 680, I'll tell what you'd be doing different in the 640. Anyway, the first thing we need to do is go take a look at our scan settings and see what we need to do to set the scanner up once we install it. So let's go take a look at that right now. So when you first launch Epson Fast Photo software, the folder will default to the last folder it was open. In this case, this particular folder I've moved so it can't find it. If you want to open another folder like something you scanned previously, you can click the folder button over here and navigate to a previous folder if you want to look at some of the images. It's pretty important you understand the settings that you can apply before you start your scanning. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at those. So let's just start at the top under organization. You can either select a folder to put your files in. If you want to store them away on a separate hard drive, something like that, or you can choose to save them to your photos folder. And this will put folders within that folder. Uh, I assume under windows, that's the my photos folder. If you select a folder, then here's where you put the folder name, you actually can go locate it on your hard drive. Just click the folder button. Typically this would be a master folder and then each batch that you scan, it will create a folder within that to store them if you tell it to. File name prefix is something you can put on there if you would like to have some set name in front of each one. However, I find that I would prefer to use the software and I leave the prompt me to describe each batch before scanning because that allows me to set the prefix and it's more useful than just a general name. Typically the prefix includes some information about the date the picture was taken and maybe even a little information about what the picture is about. If you turn this off, then when you push the scan button, it will just immediately scan to whatever folder you've got uh, set up here and it will use whatever file name prefix uh, you've decided to put here. As far as enhancements, in the last video I talked about the problem with a 680 and auto enhance. I think if you're using a 680, I would encourage you to maybe experiment, but I, I found that auto enhance doesn't work very well in the 680. It creates a lot of noise. Uh, go take a look at that video. I'll put a link to it up in the corner. 
But if you're using the 640, the auto enhance seems to work pretty well. Uh, so for some reason on the 680, it seems to add noise to the image. Some of it pretty, pretty bad. I've never turned red and removed red eye on. I don't know how well it works. Something that you can try if you want, if you have a lot of snapshots with red eye. You can also restore faded colors if you're scanning old photographs that have lost some of their original color. The 680 has a little bit better color restoration sometimes, but overall the 640 does an okay job as well. As far as these enhancements are concerned, you can have them applied to the scanned photograph or you can have the original photograph scanned, saved, and a second copy applied with the enhancements. Now, one thing I will mention is once we get into the reviewing of the images, you can also at that point apply enhancement and apply color restoration. So the scan settings document allows you to set the resolution and the format that you save the file. Most of the time you'll be using standard photos as the photo type. Instant photos applies to Polaroids. I'm assuming that changes the way the feed mechanism works a little because Polaroids are pretty stiff and sometimes has a hard time going through the scanner. And I assume that panoramic also has the same uh, effect and somehow helps with the tracking of the long print. As far as whether you should do 300, 600, or 1200, uh, 300 DPI is more resolution than the average snapshot from the 60s to the 80s had in the paper. Color photographic paper doesn't have that much ability to hold detail. Um, if you're scanning more recent things, like from high-end uh, inkjet printers, you might have a little more detail there. But you really won't be able to see the difference between a 300 and a 600 DPI scan. The only difference would be if you are viewing them, the 600 DPI sort of down reses to show in the same space. And so that might help reduce some of the artifacting that the 680 has. As far as printing them out, it might also help that as well. But there's a little bit of a problem. The other choice, of course, is whether to save as a JPEG or a TIFF. And right now, unfortunately, the software, at least for the Mac, has a little bit of a, a bug in it. Let me just show you that really quick. So if we take a look at file sizes, this says for three and a half by five print. And we scan them, we find that a 300 DPI the JPEG files are around 275 kilobytes in size and the TIFFs are around six megabytes in size. There's something wrong with that six megabyte because that doesn't add up correctly. And it's even worse when we go to the 600 DPI. A JPEG at 600 DPI is about 7.7 .7 megabytes and a TIFF is about 24 megabytes. Now let's take a real quick look at what the math says. The To calculate the uh, size of a TIFF file is pretty straightforward if you're not doing any compression. It's just simply the dots per inch times the sizes times three. So a 300 DPI scan of a three and a half by five inch print should be about 4.7 megabytes. And a 600 DPI scan of the same print should be about 19 megabytes. So I'm not really sure where the extra size is coming from. But what's really bad is that 600 DPI JPEG, the 7.7 .7 megabytes, that should be like one megabyte. It's taking about seven times more space to save that JPEG file. And I can't even get a file that large if I take the TIFF file and export it at full 100% JPEG quality. Even then I only end up with about a six megabyte file. Let me just show you real quick some of my results so you kind of know what I'm talking about. So basically what I did is I took five of my three and a half by fives and I scanned them. And if you see here, at 300 DPI saved as a JPEG, they're averaging about 280 kilobytes. You know, it depends on the subject matter. It depends on how big they actually are. So that's pretty normal. But at 600 DPI, you'll see that they're averaging almost 8 megabytes. And this really should be about 1 megabyte. At uh, 300 DPI and a TIFF file, we're about 6 megabytes. And as I mentioned, that should be about 4.7. And here we're 24 megabytes, and that should be about 18. So what I did is I took the 600 DPI TIFF files in Lightroom and then I saved them out as TIFF files. So basically I've created the exact same file and yet it's the correct size of about 18 megabytes. Here I took the same TIFF files and exported them out as JPEG files. And this is JPEG quality 60, which is a kind of corresponds to the size I'm getting from the 300. And you'll see I'm well under a megabyte. So even a JPEG 70 or 75 would be nowhere near the 7.7 .7 megabytes that we're getting. And then of course, if I take the 300 DPI and save them as 60, you'll see that these are the numbers are very similar to what I got. 
So it tells me two things. First of all, the JPEG compression is a little aggressive and they don't give you a way to adjust that. Second, there's something very wrong with what they're doing with the TIFF files. It's they're way too large and extremely wrong with what they're doing with the 600 DPI JPEG files. I know it's an extra step, but if you really do want to save them as uh, 600 DPI JPEGs, you probably would be better off if you uh, scan them and saved them as TIFF and then use some program to convert those TIFFs down to JPEGs because otherwise it's going to take seven or eight times more storage space than you really need. And that adds up to about 30 times more storage space than if you were saving 300 DPI JPEGs. So in my case, I'm just using the 300 DPI because I think that's plenty fast enough. They're JPEGs. I think the quality is plenty good enough. On a TV, they look great. On my phone, they look great. And I even printed a couple of 3x5s, and they look very close to the originals. In fact, most of them look a little better because there's a little better color to them. As I mentioned, it's a waste to use the 1200 DPI interpolated because it's just basically doing an up res. You have no control of the quality. So there's really no reason to do that. You're better off doing that in Photoshop because it's not going to give you any better detail. As far as the last setting on this, it's whether to scan the back of your photo. And this basically detects whether there's any writing on the back. This is important for old snapshots. And if you tell it to scan the back, you have uh, four settings. One is dark, which means the writing has to be pretty dark before it triggers and saves that file. One is medium, and then one is light. And then, of course, you can say all, which means it will scan the back of every photograph regardless of whether there's printing or not, which probably would only be useful if there is indeed writing on the back of every print or almost every one, and you don't want to miss any of them. If you get any that you don't want later, once we get through this process, it's very easy to delete the files that you don't want. That's a real quick step, so no big problem there. Advanced setting, auto rotation, I leave it on. It doesn't work real well, but it does work some. I've never had a problem with curled photo correction. I've never tried it. If you're scanning a pretty curly photograph by this description, it sounds like that might cause brightness on the edges, so you might try turning that on. Reduce lines and streaks is probably a good feature to leave on if a little piece of dust gets on your scan mechanism that stays stationary so as the print moves across the end result is a small thin light line it's important to keep that cleaned off but in the meantime this will help reduce that as well this setting allows you to upload your images directly to dropbox or to google drive i don't use that but it might be handy for some people this basically allows you to set some settings on the scanner such as how long it uh, before it goes to sleep and also there's a button on the scanner and you can select the application when you push that button and that you want to open on your computer. Normally I use Fast Photo because that's the one I'm going to use. As far as other settings, this simply allows the software to send information to Epson. I typically never do that. So that kind of covers the settings. So now we've done that. We've set this up to scan. We're going to restore faded colors. We're going to leave auto enhance off. We're going to save a second copy with the re restored colors. And we'll also save the original as well when we scan it. We're going to go at 300 DPI, so it's fairly fast. And we're going to save it as a JPEG. And I think that's it. So let's go ahead and close this. And now we're ready to scan our first batch of photos. Okay, so now we've got our scanner set up, ready to scan. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to move the mic back a little bit just so I don't get it in the way. Hopefully my voice will still come in pretty good. <clears throat> With a 680, you just pop it open like this, and you pull the tray out of the bottom. Okay, it does have a little catch here, so basically you want to do this about the size of your prints, so they'll stack up kind of nice and neatly. All right, we're ready to go to the computer and actually start our session now. So all we do is hit Start Scanning. Okay. This asks you for a year, if you put a year in. So we're gonna say these were taken in 1982. And then if you put a month in, the year and the month will be set as the capture time. We're just gonna say January. Will be set as the capture time for your uh, images. So when you import them in other software, that's when it'll think they were taken. The subject is something you can put anything you want. It will remember everything you put in there. Typically, you just want to put a brief description. 
I'm just going to put family snaps, family from, I think these go from November 82 to June 83. That's actually the span that this box covers right here. Okay, I'm going to tell it to create a subfolder for this batch of pictures. So it's going to put them, and this is where you're going to tell them where to go. So this master folder you set in the preferences, and it's important that you set that up and then you allow it to put a subfolder in there. It tells us here how to load it. So basically we want to put them in face forward. There are two scan mechanisms in this, one front and one back. In the 680, the photo quality one is in the front, the document quality one is in the back. So you put them photograph first. If you're scanning a document, you put it face down. The 640 is the opposite. The 640 has the photo quality scanner on the back, document scanner on the front. So in the 640, you push them face for forward. So we're ready to start scanning. We're gonna take our first batch. So what I do is I take a batch of about 30 or 40, photo, well, maybe 20, 40 gross. I try to get them even on the bottom. I always flip them like this to make sure there's none stuck together. Okay, drop them in the scanner. As I said, even though it's gonna scan from the back to the front. The new software fixes the order, so you don't have to worry about that. And then we just hit start scanning. Very quick, this is at 300 DPI, so I'm getting about one scan a second. At 600 DPI, it takes about three seconds per scan, so not bad. So what I do with the 640, you can just let them keep stacking up because they'll stack up in order because they're face down. Problem with the 680 is now, this is my first picture and if I put another stack, it's gonna go on top of it. So with the 680, I take every stack out when I'm done. 640, I let them stack up a little ways because they're stacking up in order. So I take them and then I turn them vertical, stick them in the back of my box. I take the next batch, same thing. I usually don't look about the face down part. Um, I'm assuming they're face up in the box, so I'm gonna put them face down. You'll notice I've kind of sp spread them out like this, so the back one's gonna hit first and then they'll fall down. And then I just go back to scan next batch. Pretty cool, pretty cool. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, scan the rest of these. There's no reason for you to sit there and watch it all. And when I get the box scanned, then we'll go back and show what happens in the software and how you can do some of editing there. Okay, so we've almost got the box scanned. This is my last little batch here. It's been about, I've taken, it's about, I don't taken me about four minutes so far. You'll notice that I've had a little alert pop up on my screen that tells me to clean your scanner often. Um, it says it's detected dirt, and that's an option that you can set up. Uh, it's pretty easy to clean. You open it up and use microfiber cloth. Generally, these are a little more aggressive in the warning. Uh, we'll see if there's a bunch of lines on the prints or not. Anyway, let's hit our uh, final batch here. Now I noticed as I was going through this, some of these are pretty poor quality, a lot of discoloration. Um, I don't know if you can see them in the camera or not, but, but that's really bad. And so it'll be interesting to see how the color restoration part does. Um, anything will help. All right, so now that we're done scanning, we simply say we're done scanning. This will take a few minutes. So we scanned 216 photographs. So one reason this might be slow is we've told it to do color restoration, and it might actually be doing that process now. I don't know. One thing I found is that you can do the color restoration picture by picture later if you want. It seems to me there's a slight difference between letting it do it now and not, but we'll take a look when we get these all scanned. So if you watch the order of these, as this loads, suddenly you'll see the order change. So the top left picture will suddenly be different. And that means that because it was a 680, it just put everything back in order how they were in your box. 
So once you scan your images, you'll see that you can have the before, or this is the, this is the unenhanced version, and then here's the enhanced version, and they're all sequential in the list. You also have the ones with the writing on the back in case there was writing, and you'll see in this case there wasn't very many, but there are some. So the first thing to do, uh, you have two options. First is to decide which of each one you're going to keep, and you can do those one at a time. Typically, you're only going to want to keep one of these, so you just look at one, look at the other, click the one you're going to throw away, and just hit the delete key, and, and then hit enter. In this particular case, I would think that almost all of these I will keep the enhanced version. When you come to ones that are, need to be rotated, if you go up here to the edit menu, you can click one of the rotate buttons to get the orientation right. Make sure you click off of one and click one before you hit delete so you don't delete both of them. It used to be you could hold uh, Command or Control or Option R, I'm not sure what it was, and you could actually rotate them with a keyboard. But I have found that for some reason in this last version that doesn't seem to work. Most of the time in these old pictures when I scan, I don't want to keep the originals. And if I scroll through this, I think you'll agree that almost every one of the Enhanced versions are better. Some aren't a lot different, but they're slightly better. The only exception are, is this little batch right here, which I think this did a pretty poor job of restoring. I might be able to fix it better. One thing that I was going to mention is if we look at this is the enhanced version, so we can go and apply the enhancement now. So all we did was a color restore. So if I hit color restore now, and you'll see that it actually did the exact same thing. I'm not sure where I got the idea that it was slightly different. It must have been an illusion I looked at. So one possibility, if you want to, is just to scan everything. Don't do any enhancement and do it all later because you can apply enhancement, you can apply restoration, and you can apply red eye all after the fact. Obviously, it takes a little more time. In my case, I'm scanning them all with the restore turned on, and I am not saving the originals. I'm scanning... The, I'm just uh, saving those to the original files to save time, so I'm only scanning and creating enhanced versions. Uh, in this particular folder, because I did it, I might do it a little bit differently, but it's still going to be pretty hard. Now, one thing you can do, if you apply an enhancement and you don't like what you did, your undo uh, button is over here, and you can just take that away. Another thing you can do over here, you can limit what you're seeing in the list. So I can say, I just want to see the originals. And so now I'm only seeing the unenhanced version. Or I can say, I just want to see the enhanced. Now I'm seeing the just enhanced version. Then you'll notice I can click on more than one. So I can say, I want to see the enhanced and I want to see the text on back. Now in this case, I might want to just get rid of all the originals. So one way to do that is to go here and you can't do a select all and you can't do a shift click to select contiguous but what you can do is kind of click outside of a picture and start dragging a box Let's see if i can get it to work and you can even drag down it'll scroll so that's how you would do a select all so if i decided i just wanted to get rid of all the originals in this job i can do there hit the delete key and they're all gone and now if I go here and I just view all. And then of course, now the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through picture by picture and fix all of the orientations. You can click on several at once if they're rotated the same way. You can just hold the command or control key down. So it's pretty easy to go through there and get them all straight. Now, the nice thing is, once you're done, this is changing. I don't know if this changes metadata or actually changes the file on the disk. But the bottom line is, now when you import them in any other software, all this orientations and everything else is fixed. As far as the writing, you'll see that it did a pretty good job of that. It only picked it up on ones where my wife actually wrote something. This is kind of 
fun to go back and look at this writing of hers. She passed away a few years ago and kind of seeing these pictures that she wrote on, you know, way back when we were young is kind of enjoyable. I have no idea who this is, but she tells me here this is Janice Shield. It's a friend from her high school. So it's kind of neat to see the writing. Obviously, some writing can be much more important than others, but that's really one of the nicest features about this uh, little scanner is that you can re preserve all that r relatively easily. And you'll notice that the file names are the same. The only difference is it's added a B to the file. So here's the picture and then the same name with, with an A. That means it was enhanced when you scanned it. And then here it is with a B. So once I'm done, this is all saved to the folder that I put it in, and I'm pretty much ready to do my next step, whatever that is in your own particular workflow. In my case, I pull these into Lightroom. I tend to put them back in order because they've been jumbled up in the box, and I can figure uh, my wife's camera put a little date down here. So I kind of go through and kind of move them around. One thing you can't do is you can't click and change the order here. But in Lightroom, I can change the order, then I can renumber them so that the sequential number looks the same. You'll notice here some of the things uh, really aren't together. It's jumbled up a little bit. It's a little bit of a pain, and I don't know if I'm going to do it all the time. But uh, once I get them all scanned, I'm ready to go. And then once I do that, I'll save them out. And then I put them in, personally, I put them into Apple Photos. And I also might put them on, uh, I have a cloud service that I've kind of, I run on a NAS uh, that I have. And I, it's got a pretty cool program. It's a Synology NAS, and it's got a, the ability to create my own little cloud server where these all sit. And anybody that I want to, I can give them a address, and they can look them up and actually get access to them. I think that pretty well does it. I think I explained everything right. It's As you can see, it's pretty straightforward. The software is actually much better than when Epson first came out with this printer. This ability to go through and clean them up and edit them, it's actually pretty cool. So if you have any questions that I missed, uh, please feel free to make a comment uh, down below and I'll try to answer the question. Hopefully in another couple, three weeks, I'll have the one that tells you, shows you how a technique I use to get pretty high quality snaps with my iPhone for these old snapshots. For a lot of people, that's a really, it, I mean, all it costs you is a fairly high quality bulb, which is 10, 15 bucks, and then rigging up a cardboard box to hold your phone. And you can literally put pictures in and out and push the button. So it actually is pretty quick. Certainly not one a second, but it's also not 650 bucks. So anyway, until next time, see ya.